Good morning. morning. I want to welcome each of you to our services here at First Baptist Church of Middlesbrough today. We also welcome those of you who are joining us by television. We do have just a quick matter of business we need to take care of before we get started with our worship service today. Uh, Most of you know it is um, during August we have deacon elections. It's a three-step process, and today is the first step where we ask you to nominate seven names from the list that you have been given. This is for church members to fill out. Circle seven names. Uh, If you circle eight by mistake, your whole ballot's going to get discarded, so please make sure and count correctly. And if you don't know how to count, get your wife to do that for you. Uh, But uh, make sure seven names, and uh, I'm going to give you just a, I know some of you are just getting those, and it is a very important thing not to be rushed through. So go ahead and take just a couple of minutes and uh, work through this. I've got to finish mine as well, and I'll come back and share some announcements with you in just a moment. Did anyone not receive a ballot that that needs one? Okay, um, Trish, Pat over here. and um... As you're filling them out, I'll remind you how the rest of the process will go. Uh, Once these are collected and tabulated later uh, in the afternoon, all persons who receive five or more nominations will be contacted uh, to see if they would be willing to serve if elected. Uh, I know because it's still vacation season, sometimes it's hard to get hold of everybody, but our goal is to try to contact all those who receive five nominations, ask them that question, and by next Sunday be able to share with you who will be actually on the ballot uh, three, two Sundays from today on the 15th of August. So two Sundays from today, we will come back and have the official election, electing seven deacons to replace the seven who have rotated off. Okay. If you have had a chance, and hopefully you have, to fill yours out, we'll ask you to fold it. Uh, I guess once is enough. And then pass them to the inside towards the one towards the inside aisle and if you're in the middle I guess either way will work but uh, if I, I assume we have some people that are going to, you one of the people okay Wade's willing to take your ballots up and look at the announcements while we're wrapping things up with the nominations. Tomorrow, our cookie brigade will be uh, delivering cookies and brownies to yet another group in our community. If you're on the August committee, please remember to have your cookies and brownies here at the church by noon. On Tuesday, the Partners in Hope um, project that we've been working on will be completed, and we will be delivering several boxes to Boonville in Owsley County, Kentucky. I think we had 19 or 20 names of school children that needed clothes, and uh, we had two different people or families for each child uh, volunteer to provide clothes, and some others have also purchased additional items. So we're going to be taking 
uh, the vans up on Tuesday to deliver those. And if you'd like to go with us, uh, we'd love to have you go. I just need for you to tell me before you leave the service today so that we can make sure and plan for appropriate transportation. But uh, I think it's nice when we can uh, not just send things, but go see the people that we're, we're dealing with, ministering to, and uh, to have developed this partnership with. So if you are free and can go with us, we're going to be leaving Tuesday morning at 830. Should be back early afternoon. Tuesday night, the discipleship committee will meet. Uh, we had so many who were on this committee out of town last week, we had to reschedule. So if you're on the discipleship committee, that meeting will be this Tuesday at 6.30. The youth ministry team will meet Wednesday. Uh, well, there are several things we need to work on. I know right now we don't have a youth minister, but we need to keep activities going for our youth. And we have fifth quarters to plan, uh, fall retreat to plan, and other things as well. So if you're on the youth ministry team and can be here Wednesday night at 5.30, we sure would appreciate it. Uh, Thursday, the House Committee and the Children's Committee are going to meet. They're working on a project of renovating the preschool area and perhaps other portions of that side of the building. And uh, uh, in your calendar that you received in your newsletter, unfortunately, this showed up on Wednesday night that it's supposed to be Thursday night, August 5th. So please make note of that, too. This weekend, we have a very, very special event. We have a potluck dinner planned for Saturday night and there's a purpose behind it not just to get together and eat uh, normally that would be enough for us but this has a uh, even a greater significance so we're going to be introducing to you Beth Parker uh, she is the candidate that the personnel committee is presenting to the church for the minister a music position uh, Beth and her family are with us today and we're so glad to have them but you'll have a chance Saturday night to spend some time with them and uh, following the meal at 7 30 I believe it is the choir will meet upstairs in the choir room with her and then next week Beth will be leading the music and singing for us and just continue to pray with us that God's will might be done in this process as we seek to find our next minister of music. I know we've taken up more time than normal with this so I'm going to be quiet. You do have an insert. I better say that for a wedding coming up. Don't make sure and take note of that as well. But we're glad you're here today. Uh, I know things are starting to get back to settling down. School starts back this week, and I'm hoping that we'll be able to increase our, our numbers a bit and, and be able to uh, uh, strengthen our worship as we come together in the Lord's name to, to give him honor and glory and praise through our worship. And, and I hope that's why you're here today. I realize there's a lot of different reasons we come to church, but the primary reason has to be that we have come to worship our Lord and Savior. Let's prepare our hearts to do just that as we have the chiming of the hour. Let's stand and sing hymn 16, I Worship the King. Please stand. <laughs>
Good morning. Let us remember that this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we come to you this morning thanking you for your many blessings in life. We thank you for your love, your mercy, and most of all, your saving grace. We come to you also this morning asking you that you would bless this country, remember its leaders, and remember those soldiers that are fighting overseas. Father, we ask also this week that you remember all the children that are going back to school, the teachers and administrators. Help us, Lord, to be a light to others as we go back into our workplaces. Father, we ask that you also remember this church. Help us to be a light shining on the hill that others may find you. Also, we ask this morning that you bless Chuck. May the Holy Spirit lead and guide him as he brings the message to us. Now let us pray to prayer that you taught us. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you, Jeff. At this time, we're going to ask the children to come forward for the children's sermon. Good morning, boys and girls. Great to have you in church today. I guess y'all are real excited about going back to school, aren't you? I'm not because I hate to go back to school. Do you really? Well, it'll get better, and I hope y'all have a wonderful I school year. School. Let me ask you, how many of y'all ever have dreams? I had a nightmare. You had a nightmare? Yeah, and it was a silly nightmare. A silly nightmare. It I kept just a phoning because all of the sense I got out the dream, and I keep going back until this morning. All right. What would you think if you had a dream one night, and God appeared to you in that dream and said, you can have any wish you want? I don't would that be a pretty cool dream? What would you wish for if God told you you can have anything you want? What would, you, what would it be for you, Madeline? Money. Money. Lots of money or just a little bit of money? Just a little bit? Okay. What about you, Rachel? A dog? Okay. If you could, what would it be for you, Tom? Rich. Be rich? Okay. What would it be for you? If you could have anything, what would you wish for? A thousand something, something, something. A thousand something, something. Okay. Anybody else from McDonald's? Okay. Anybody else have a wish that they would make if they could wish for anything? And I wish I could eat What else? Money for your dog? Okay, those are some pretty cool wishes. Well, did you know that this really happened a long time ago? God appeared to a young man in a dream and said, you can have whatever you wish for. His name was Solomon. You may have heard about him. He was a king that followed David, and um, he was being faithful, and God honored him, said, I'll, I'll give you your request, whatever you want. And Solomon thought about it, and he probably thought about money. He probably thought that would be pretty cool to, to be rich. He may have thought about uh, being powerful and conquering all of his enemies, but, but he didn't ask for that either. He didn't ask for expensive jewelry or clothes or a fancy chariot or anything like that. Do you know what Solomon asked for when God gave him that chance to wish anything? You may know what he wished for. He wished for wisdom. He wished for wisdom. He said, God, I'm young and I've, you've made me king of these people and I need wisdom to help me make the right decisions. And God thought that was a wonderful answer. In fact, God said, because you've answered so well, Solomon, I'm going to give you things you didn't ask for. I'm going to make you rich. I'm going to make you famous. I'm going to make you powerful. But I think Solomon's a wonderful example for us. One of the things all of us need is wisdom. Now, here I'm not just talking about being smart and having a high IQ so that we can do well in school. That, that's cool, and that, that, I mean, that helps if, if you've got that. But the wisdom we're talking about here is something totally different. It's something spiritual, and it's something that the Bible says God will give us if we ask. In fact, in the New Testament, in the first chapter of James, 
James says, if anyone lacks wisdom, let him ask God who gives generously. Do you sometimes lack wisdom? Do you sometimes not really know for sure what the right thing to do is? Now, I don't know if that's the case for you or not, but it's the case for me a lot of times. And I'm very thankful that God has told us that we can ask for wisdom. And boys and girls, I thought it'd be a wonderful thing if we all did that today. James says we can do it, so let's do it. Let's ask for wisdom today, that God would give us wisdom to know the difference between right and wrong, and that he would give us the courage always to do what's right. And I hope the rest of you will do that as well, because I think that's a pretty cool prayer and one that God will honor. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gift of another day. Uh, you bless us so much, uh, day after day after day. Your mercies are renewed. You, you take care of our needs, and we have so much to be thankful for. And I thank you for the story from Solomon's life that we've been reminded of and the kids will study later in their extended session. But today we want to follow in Solomon's steps and we want to pray and ask that you would grant each and every one of us wisdom. Not so that we can be smarter, but so that we can be wiser and, and do that which is right. We live in a world where it's confusing sometimes and, and we don't always understand the right thing to do. But God, you have promised that you will help us, that you will give us that wisdom if only we ask. So we humbly ask this morning that you would bless us all with wisdom to do what is right and go on and give us courage, Father, so that we will do that which you ask us to. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, guys. In just a moment, we're going to sing as our fellowship hymn, uh, hymn number 23, God is so good. And I think you'd have to admit with me that he is. He is so good. He, he just every day he proves his goodness and his faithfulness and his love to us. And before we have a chance to sing, we have a chance to fellowship with those around us, to, to greet one another, uh, extend a good hand of fellowship. And I'm going to encourage you to do that. If you're a member, a regular attender, we ask you to stand. If you're a guest with us for the first time, please remain seated just a moment. Our ushers will give you a visitor's card. We would appreciate it if you'd fill it out and return it later in the offering plate. Let's greet one another in a moment. We'll sing together. God God is so good. ask you to take your pew Bibles and turn with me to Psalm 119. Uh, for several weeks we've been making a journey through Psalm 119 and today we'll read two more sections, uh, reading verses 97 through 112 together. 
And Psalms, of course, is a book of prayers, and we can make it a part of our prayers as well today. So we'll read this together before going to God with our own individual prayers. Let's read together Psalm 119, verses 97 through 112. Let's read together. Oh, how I love your law. I meditate on it all day long. Your commands make me wiser than my enemies, for they are ever with me. I have more insight than all my teachers, for I meditate on your statutes. I have more understanding than the elders, for I obey your precepts. I have kept my feet from every evil path, so that I might obey your own. I have not departed from your laws, for you yourself have taught me. How sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. I gain understanding from your precepts, therefore I hate every wrong path. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light for my path. I have taken an oath and confirmed it, that I will follow your righteous laws. I have suffered much, preserve my life, O Lord, according to your word. Accept, O Lord, the willing praise of my mouth and teach me your laws. Though I constantly take my life in my hands, I will not forget your laws. The wicked have set a snare for me, but I have not strayed from your precepts. Your statutes are my heritage forever. They are the joy of my heart. My heart is set on keeping your decrees to the very end. With these words in mind, let's go to God with our prayers. Heavenly Father, just a few moments ago, we all gathered together and prayed for wisdom. And here in this passage we've just read together, we're reminded that one of the places that we can go to to, to discern wisdom and, and instruction is your word. And we thank you so much that you have given us the guidance of the word. And, and I pray that, that we will indeed uh, study your word and make it a lamp to our feet and have it as a light for our path so that we will not stumble and fall. Lord, I pray that you would help us to be disciplined in our study, that we will take time each day to pay attention to what it is you are saying to us through your holy word. We know you have other ways of speaking to us as well, so give us ears to hear so that whenever you try to get our attention, whenever your Holy Spirit prompts us, that we will recognize that you are speaking, that we will listen, and that we will obey. I pray that we will come to the point where we can say that your word is sweeter than the taste of honey to our lips. I pray it will be that which we prize above everything else. God, you are an awesome God, and it's through your word we discover this. We see over and over again how you have proven yourself to be faithful and true, how you are the God who made us, the God who sustains us, the God who loved us so much that he sent his son to save us from our sins, to provide for us eternal life, to make our lives worth living even here and now. God, we do have so much to be thankful for this morning. We have so much to be thankful for for as individuals, as families, as a church, as a community, as a state, and as a nation, and on and on it goes, Lord, you have been good. And I pray that, that today you will hear our offering of thanksgiving, and it will be acceptable in your ears. Lord, we come to you always as needy people, and today is no different. There are many in our community, in our church, even here today, who are struggling, who are hurting for one reason or another. And we thank you that we can come to you and, and lift up our brothers and sisters, lift up our own needs to you, knowing that you care more than anyone else, knowing that you are able more than anyone else to meet our needs. And I pray that you would give us the faith to, to bring our needs to you and to trust you to, to hear and to answer our prayers. Lord, we know that many times you work through us, and I pray that you would help us to be sensitive to the needs of those around us so that we can reach out to those who are grieving, to those who are sick, to those who are lonely and struggling, to those who, who are confused, those who, who may have problems that, that, that seem unbearable. Lord, help us to truly be your people, to be there for one another, for we know that is our calling. I just thank you so much that today we can gather to worship you and we need this time together, Lord. And uh, we benefit so much from coming here, but we know that in the end, the main thing is that we worship you, that we praise you and that we put everything in perspective and help us to keep our perspective where it should be today. Help us to keep our focus on you. And we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen.
Our offertory hymn is The Bond of Love. That's 384. Let's stand. Let us pray. Father, once again, we come to you so thankful for everything that you've done for us. It's now come time, Lord, for us to remember you in our tithes and offerings. We just ask that you would take these tithes and offerings and that they may be used for the glorification of your kingdom. And it's in your son's precious name we pray. Amen.
Before I share something in music with you, I want to tell you um, the past six years that I've been with you, it's hard to describe how much the body of Christ affects and enriches your life. Many times you, you won't know for years to come, but even having said that, I know right now that the opportunity that I've had to work with you, to worship with you, to be your friends, to, to socialize with you, it has meant so much to me. And although I wasn't planning on, on doing the special music this morning, when, when I determined that I would, I thought, well, what is appropriate? And it's difficult to know that except what is always appropriate is the realization that God is faithful. God is faithful when we aren't. God is faithful when we're not sure. And one of the greatest hymns that I feel has ever been written that has, that has expressed that is great is thy faithfulness. So I'll share that. Thank you. 
crying than I'm used to doing and I'm going to try not to today but I'm just so thankful for Todd Spangler and I hope Todd you know that we love you and are so very grateful for all you've done for us. Let me ask you to turn in your Bibles to Colossians chapter 3 and we will read together this morning verses 12 through 17 together. Colossians 3, verses 12 through 17. Let's read God's word, and as we read, let's also listen carefully to what the Holy Spirit might be saying to us this morning. Let's read. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you, and over all these virtues put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of the body you were called to peace, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom. And as you sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs with gratitude in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to the God the Father through him. May God add his blessing to the reading, hearing, and the preaching of his word this day. We return this morning to the topic of fellowship. At the conclusion of my last message on this subject, I made the point that the Christian life involves more than just a commitment to Jesus Christ. It also includes a commitment to other Christians. We talked a bit about the importance of church membership and how whereas you become a Christian by, by making a commitment to Christ, you become a church member by making a commitment to a specific group of believers. The first decision brings about salvation. The second decision brings about fellowship. Now, I'm afraid we live in a time when the ideal of community, the ideal of fellowship is quickly evaporating. We are much more prone these days to, to think in terms of the individual rather than the community. The same way of thinking unfortunately has even affected how we approach church. Many Christians today fail to see the necessity of being linked with other believers. Rick Warren gives us something to think about when he writes, whenever a child is born, he or she automatically becomes a part of the universal family of human beings. But that child also needs to become a member of a specific family to receive nurture and care and grow up healthy and strong. This is true spiritually as well. When you were born again, you automatically became a part of God's universal family. But you also need to become a part of a local expression of God's family. Without the help of other believers, it is very unlikely that you or I will ever grow up spiritually and be strong as Christians. It's just the way God has designed it. He's designed it so that you and I need one another. Now, you may not like it that way, but it doesn't change a thing. In his book, The Call, Os Guinness notes, the call of Jesus is personal, but not purely individual. Jesus summons his followers not only to an individual calling, but also to a corporate calling. 
Guinness goes on to say, each of us is summoned individually and therefore uniquely and personally. But we are not summoned to be a bunch of individual believers, rather to be a community of faith. Warren states the same principle a bit more succinctly. He says, life is meant to be shared. God intends for us to experience life together. The Bible calls this shared experience fellowship. Now, the biblical concept of fellowship, as I shared with you two weeks ago, is, is far more than a bunch of Baptists gathering around a table and, and eating a meal. Genuine fellowship, the kind we read about in the scriptures, includes unselfish loving, honest sharing, practical serving, sacrificial giving, and sympathetic comforting. It means living out the Christian life within a community of faith. As you read about the early church in the book of Acts, it becomes clear that they experienced genuine fellowship. Acts 2.42 says they devoted themselves to the apostles' teachings and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Another picture of this fellowship is painted for us two chapters later. When in chapter 4, verse 32, we read, All the believers were one in heart and mind. No one claimed that any of his possessions was his own, but they shared everything they had. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and, and much grace was upon them. There were no needy persons among them, for from time to time those who owned lands or houses sold them brought the money from the cells and put it at the apostles' feet and it was distributed to anyone who had need. In these pictures of the early church, it's obvious that the believers were there for one another. They seemed to think more in the terms of community or the corporate nature of the church rather than in terms of the individual. And I cannot help but believe this morning that this was God's ideal for the church. It was his desire that, that Christians would bind their lives with that of other Christians so that together the body of Christ might be made stronger. And the truth is we are much stronger together than we are separately. I was given a sermon to listen to by a friend a couple of weeks ago and in this sermon the speaker talks about the outcome of a particular horse pull out west. I believe it was in the state of Colorado. At this event, the champion horse pulled 8,000 pounds. The runner-up pulled 6,000 pounds, a big difference between the two. But someone came up with the idea it would be neat to, to put the two together, to team them up and see what they might pull together. They put them together, and together they pulled 17,000 pounds. Hooked up together, they pulled far more weight than the combined totals of their individual efforts. And the same result can be seen over and over again in the church. When we link up with other Christians, when we, we work together as a team, we are able to accomplish far more for God than we could ever begin to accomplish as individual Christians working alone. It is no wonder God wants all of his children to be hooked up with a group of believers. He knows that his kingdom benefits tremendously when we fellowship together. And I definitely want to emphasize the word fellowship here because if I had just said that God's kingdom benefits tremendously when we gather together, that would not necessarily be true. Just because a group of Christians get together periodically for worship, Bible study, or for a meal does not mean that genuine fellowship actually takes place. Sometimes that which is called fellowship is anything but that. So what's the difference? What's the difference between real fellowship and fake fellowship? Rick Warren offers four suggestions. First, he says in real fellowship, people experience authenticity. Authentic fellowship is not superficial, surface level chit-chat. It, it is genuine, heart-to-heart, -heart, sometimes even gut-level sharing. It happens when people get honest about who they are and, and what's going on in their lives. It happens when they share their hurts, reveal their feelings, confess their failures, disclose their doubts, admit their fears, acknowledge their weaknesses, and ask for help and prayer. 
Now, sad to say, this is not something you find very often in today's churches. Instead of an atmosphere of honesty and humility, there seems to be so much pretending going on, a, a lot of, of role-playing and so much shallow conversation. It, it's almost as though everyone wears masks to church these days, wanting those around them to think that everything's just hunky-dory in their lives, when in reality that is not the case. And it's not the case, is it? If the truth be known, every one of us has more than his or her share of problems. We may gather here and look like we have our act together, but I suspect we all know by now that that's not true, that it's all show. We may not want to admit it, but each and every one of us struggle with things like self-confidence, fear of failure and rejection with the inevitability of death. We polish our little halos when we come to church, but the truth of the matter is we all still have doubts. The truth of the matter is we all have our weaknesses. We all have our questions. We all have our fears that, that keep us from being the Christians that we want to be. Well, if that's the case, then why all the show? If that's the case, why all the mask? The church was never meant to be a gathering place for saints. It's supposed to be a hospital for sinners. Yet some of us are afraid to admit that we are sick. We're afraid to admit we have problems. And as long as we keep up this masquerade, we are never going to get better, nor are we going to be able to help anyone else get better. It's only as we become open about our lives that we experience genuine fellowship. No, yes, I realize that it's risky. It's risky being honest with others. It, it takes a great deal of courage and humility to come to a place like this and admit that we are weak, that we have doubts, or that we have made some major mistakes in our past. Wanting to be accepted by others, we may not be prone to be honest and open, but we are going to have to do just that if we want to grow spiritually and be healthy emotionally. The book of James says, Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. I would like to think that we can muster the courage we need to take down the mask and begin to be honest with one another. If we don't learn to practice such authenticity, I'm afraid that we will never experience genuine fellowship as a church. The second thing you will experience in real fellowship is mutuality. Now some of you may wonder, what in the world is mutuality? Well, here's your answer. Mutuality is the art of giving and receiving. It's the practice of depending on each other. Warren goes so far as to say that mutuality is the heart of fellowship and involves building reciprocal relationships, sharing responsibilities, and helping each other. In the first chapter of the book of Romans, Paul tells the, the church gathered at Rome, I long to see you so that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to make you strong. That is, that you and I may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith. Paul's words here remind us that in the church God intended, there should be a lot of giving and taking going on. God blesses each of his children with gifts, but these gifts are not given for that individual's private use alone. The Bible teaches us that our gifts are given to us for the mutual edification of the church. God has given me spiritual gifts that can help you. He has given you spiritual gifts that can help me and all those around you. We can be the church God wants us to be only as we give and take, as we share our own gifts with others and as we receive from others what they have to offer us, mutuality. Paul's words also remind us how in a real fellowship of believers, Christians encourage one another. Do you like hearing encouraging words? Of course you do. I can't imagine anyone not enjoying hearing an encouraging word. In fact, it wouldn't surprise me if there are some people here today who are starving for a word of encouragement. 
Unfortunately, there are people who never get the encouragement they need, and, and too often those are the children we have in our homes. And you know, this lack of encouragement may be understandable out in a cold, cruel world, but it should never happen within the church. We are meant as God's children to encourage one another. And in encouraging one another, we grow stronger and we grow deeper in our faith. I mean, let's admit it, all of us are more consistent in our faith when others walk with us and encourage us. That's probably why over 50 times in the New Testament we are commanded to do different things to one another and to each other. Romans 14, 19 says, Make every effort to do what leads to peace and to mutual edification. In the fellowship of believers, we are supposed to be building one another up, encouraging one another, cheering one another on. And in real fellowship, that happens. In fake fellowship, people tear each other down. They, they criticize one another. They discourage people. Let me ask you, which would you rather have? Genuine fellowship or fake fellowship? And I really would like for you to think about the answer because in the end, which we are going to experience here in this church depends on you. So which is it going to be? The third thing people experience in real fellowship is sympathy. Now, sympathy is a word you hear all the time. And for most people, it simply means feeling sorry for someone. But that is not the true meaning of sympathy. True sympathy involves entering in and sharing the pain of others. The word literally means to suffer with another individual. It's been pointed out that sympathy meets two fundamental human needs. The need to be understood and the need to have our own feelings validated. Every time you understand and, and affirm someone's feelings, you build fellowship. The problem is that, that doing that is easier said by far than being done. We often get in such a hurry to, to fix things, or, or maybe we get caught up in our own little world so much that we don't have the time to slow down and really sympathize with people. The New Testament tells us that we are supposed to weep with those who weep. Well, there's no way we're going to do that unless we feel the pain of others. We cannot sympathize with someone else unless we are willing to, to spend time with them, unless we are willing to listen to their stories. It takes a good bit of effort and love to, to truly sympathize with another person. But that's precisely what we will do if we want to experience genuine fellowship. Galatians 6.2 tells us to carry or to bear one another's burdens. And that is something we will seek to do when we truly sympathize with others. Whether that, that burden be, be guilt, grief, pain, fear, or whatever, there will come a time when we will need to help another person carry his or her burden. Whether that burden be guilt, grief, pain, fear, or whatever, there will come a time when we will need someone else to carry our own burden. That's what fellowship is all about. Finally, in real fellowship, people experience mercy. Again, we live in a world where there is a great shortage of mercy. And, uh, but, but one place where there should never, ever be a shortage of mercy is this place, the church. This church and every other church is called to be a place of grace, a place where, where mistakes aren't rubbed in but rubbed out, a place where those who stumble and fall are picked back up and gently cared for, not kicked out the door and shunned. Let's face it, we all need mercy because at one time or another we all stumble and fall and require help getting back up. If we are going to be true to our calling as Christians, we need to offer mercy to others and be willing to receive mercy in return. If we are going to experience the kind of fellowship we read about in the New Testament, we have to learn to be more forgiving. You simply cannot have fellowship 
without forgiveness. God tells us to never hold grudges because bitterness and resentment always destroy fellowship. Because we are imperfect, sinful people, we inevitably hurt those we are around any sufficient amount of time. Sometimes we hurt people intentionally. At other times, it is unintentional. But either way, it takes a great deal of mercy and grace to create and to maintain fellowship. In the scripture passage we read together this morning, Paul told the Colossians, bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. If you intend to be a part of the family of God, you must practice forgiveness. Why? Because we cannot have fellowship with God. We cannot have fellowship with one another apart from it. I hope this morning that by examining what real fellowship looks like, you've come to recognize why fellowship is one of the primary purposes of the church and of our own church. Furthermore, I hope that you will resolve not to settle for fake fellowship. Too many churches have already done that. It is my heart's desire to see this church grow in its fellowship. I want to see us become a real community, a real fellowship where people can be loved and accepted just as they are. A real fellowship where we take seriously our responsibility to be there for one another. A real fellowship where we do not allow our, our differences to separate us, but instead let the love of Christ unite us. I want to see our commitment to one another and, and to God grow to the point where no one has to wonder what the priorities are at the First Baptist Church and whether we really do put first things first here as a congregation. Is that your desire too? If it is, what are you willing to do to make it happen? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for giving us a chance to, to pause these past several weeks and think about who we are and who we are called to be. We've had a chance to talk about the importance of worship, the priority of worship. We've had a chance to talk about the necessity of evangelism and outreach. We've, we've talked about discipleship, how important it is that we, we grow in our walk with you, but you've reminded us here in recent days how important fellowship is as well. And Lord, I cannot help but believe this is an area we do need to grow in. We need to begin to think more and more in terms of the community uh, of the body of Christ and less in the terms of individual. We need to learn to be there for one another and not just there for our friends, but for all those who make up our family. And Lord, I pray that you would convict us and change us and mold us and shape us into the people you want us to be. I pray that you would help us have the courage to take down the mask, to, to quit playing games, to quit putting on a show so that we might really be able to help one another and be brothers and sisters to one another. God, I pray your will would be done in each of our lives. And I know that each of us have a role to play if genuine fellowship is going to happen here at First Baptist. And I pray that you would help us to understand what it is we need to do and that we will begin doing it, not later, but here and now. All this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to sing as our invitation hymn this morning, 354, I Love Thy Kingdom, Lord. The invitation remains open for you to respond to whatever God might lead you to do today. And it could be any number of things. If you're not a Christian, it may be God has spoken to you and been speaking to you about your need to get right with him. And you really can't get right with the church till you're right with God. And so I'd encourage you to give your heart to Jesus if you've never done that. Most of you have. And, and so the question becomes, what kind of church member have you been? Are you living for the Lord like you're supposed to? Have you contributed to or detracted from the fellowship of this body? Would you like to see a sweeter fellowship? Would you like to see us move to where we are real, authentic people to one another? That's one way you could respond. They say, I don't know if Chuck, if anybody else is going to do that, but I'm going to try. 
And I want you to pray that you'll, God will help me do that. And maybe God would lead someone to become a part of this church family today. We all need a church family. There is no such thing as Lone Ranger Christianity. We need each other. It's just the way that God made us. And if you're not a member of a church anywhere, we would encourage you to come today and become a part of this fellowship. You will be gladly and warmly received. I'm going to let the Lord speak to you, listen for his voice, even as we stand and sing. You come if he's speaking to you. Hymn number 354, I love thy kingdom, Lord. Thank you so much for your presence here today and I would encourage you to give further thought to what it means to be a part of the fellowship of the First Baptist Church and what you can do to enrich that fellowship. It truly is one of the primary purposes of our church. It is our calling. We're going to close our service by singing the first and last verse of Amazing Grace. Uh, let's do that with joy and thanksgiving as we prepare to leave to serve the world about us. <laughs> <laughs>